as a monopoly. I can't just charge a million dollars for my can of, of Rockstar. Um, okay, the oligopolies are here, which are feed producers. Um, they are, they tend to work in concert with each other, and OPEC and hotel rooms in Vegas are examples of that, or carnival rides in California, you know, the, the Big Ten, you know, the, the Disneyland, and <laughs> that's very far, I mean, you know, you, you know, you know that, who we are. Um, monopolistic competitors are the, um, the ones where the products are virtually the same, but there, there's a product differentiation and it's driven usually by advertising and marketing. And then the go-to example here, this, this is OPEC, you guys think I know we talked about that. And then this would be Coke versus Pepsi, versus Pepsi. All right, and so, so same product, but they, they don't compete. They, they work together and try to act like a monopoly. MCs are closer to PCs because the products are kind of the same. But what they then do is they try to differentiate their product and they say that Rockstar is somehow better than Monster drinks, even though they're really kind of the same thing. And the cans look a little bit different and Monster has that great advertising, you know, and, and Rockstar, you know, whatever. And we, we, in our minds, we have an opinion that this is better than Monster. But, but the truth is, for all intents and purposes, they're really the same thing, probably. All right, so there's that. Any questions about that at all? We'll, we'll get back to that and talk about it more. It's, it's, kind of a foundation to everything else from here on out in terms of market. So, all right, everybody good? All right, supply and demand, here we go. There's a couple of really important things, and I'll, I'll point those out as we go. And this is what will separate this class from your, you know, high school economics, I hope. Um, this is on the exam. You're, you're going to, oh, one other, before we, sorry, one little last note. Um, there is an exam question, just just one that many, many people tend to miss. And the question is, um, the, I think it's something like products that are differentiated, which means they're really kind of the same, but they're, they're differences in those products due to marketing, fall into which of these categories? Monopolistically, or sorry, monopoly, oligopoly, monopolistically competitive, and perfect competition. And um, the, way the, the way the question is worded, Everybody in the class will pick monopoly, and I'm, I can't remember exactly why, but it, it's because of this right here. It's that monopolistically, all right. And so when when you get to that question and you have this choice between PC, MC, oligopoly, and monopoly, read it really carefully, because and for whatever reason, you know, 80% of the class will go with that. Can you say the question again? Well, I I, I hate to because I can't quite remember exactly what it is, but. Something to do with, you know, products that are differentiated fall, tend to fall into what category? And, and don't hold me to that because I can't quite remember. And there's the way it's phrased is that the knee-jerk reaction is monopoly. And everybody will go with monopoly. And I, don't, I can't quite remember exactly why. But what I'm, what I'm saying is when you get to the choice between these four and the markets, be, read it carefully because it's, the answer is this. And everybody looks at that monopoly, monopolistically competitive and chooses it. You know, you know what? Maybe I've got it backwards. No, no, no. It's the, no. It's the same. It's just it's maybe the, the the way it is is that a company that controls that is one product that controls the market. That's that's what it is. So a company that controls the market is a monopoly, but everybody answers monopolistically. That's right, because that's the first choice. That's what it is. Make sense? All right, so, so be ready for that. Just And there's only one or two questions, but we should <coughs> read the definition. That's important. Okay. Um, okay, so supply and demand. There's four parts to it, and it's like, it's kind of like <coughs> there's two parts to one side of the coin and two parts to the other side. And it's really not that big a deal. It's pretty simple, but it's all about application. And, and the application is what makes it interesting. And, and hopefully this will be something kind of above and beyond what you ever got in high school, I hope, or, or the, from what you remember. Quantity demand is the amount that buyers are willing and able to pay at a given price. So our first real chart in here, I minus maybe the PPF. So we have a demand. Um, let's say that this is a demand for Ferraris. A nice Ferrari. Okay, how much?
much does a, for a nice Ferrari cost? I don't really know. I bet it's more, but no. Two million or two hundred thousand? Two hundred thousand. Do I have a demand for a Ferrari? No. <coughs> I don't. You have a demand for it. You just can't act on it. I certainly can. So I have a demand for a Ferrari, but, but my maximum that I can pay is only 6000 So, uh, sorry, I don't really have a demand. I have a, maybe a wish list if I win the lottery, maybe that kind of thing. But I don't really have a demand for a Ferrari because, as it says, willing and able to purchase, and I'm not able to buy a Ferrari. I just don't have the money. Okay, law of demand, let me read it, and then I'll tell you what it is. All right, law of demand is, um, other things being equal is the quantity demanded, um, sorry, Law of demand says that as the price goes up, we tend to demand less. Makes sense. All right, so the law of demand says that as prices of things increase, we tend to demand less. As prices of things decrease, we tend to demand more. That, and that's kind of a fancy way to say it. So, and you're going to need that for sure. So the law of demand says as price goes up, quantity demand, or the amount we demand falls. As price goes down, the amount we demand tends to go up. <coughs> All right. Um, a couple of definitions. This is kind of Mickey Mouse, but just bear with me. I love those drinks. They're lemonade and they're delicious. Feel them when I drink them. Feel good. <laughs> Demand schedule. You will need to know this, but it's really minor. Um, a demand schedule, and it says, is a table that shows the law of demand. <laughs> so the demand schedule is a table that shows the law of demand. That's all there is to it. And there's a lot of rhetoric. Demand schedule is a table that shows the law of demand. And the exam, you know, the, the, the schedule is an NDA, a table that shows the law, a graph that shows the law of demand, a, you know, a thought. Demand schedule is here. Um, so let's just make sure everybody's interpreting this okay. And, and generally, this is really where our data will come from in terms of application to the graph. Because generally, you can go out, you do some testing, and you get data, and it goes into a table. So that's usually the first genesis of <coughs> the analysis, but that's really not here. Or there. Okay, at the price of an ice cream cone, if the price is zero, we demand 12. Why is it? <coughs> Why isn't it that if the price is zero, we don't demand 500? They're free, after all. I could go get a bunch of cones and, and share them with all my friends and open up my own stand, because i got a supply that's free. You wouldn't sell 500? Well, yeah, probably not. Why not? They'd melt. They'd melt. Because even if they're free, what, I still have transportation cost problems, right? And so I walk by and somebody says, free ice cream. And what's the first thing through your head? It's like, yeah, my mom warned me about you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, other than that, um, is that how many ice creams can I take? I mean, really, 
So even if I have a little box or something, the truth is uh, 12 is, at least according to this, is about what I can handle. So, and not only that, but I, I'm, I'll maybe eat two of them, and then I still have 10, and I have to start the process of finding my friends to dole them out. And then what's happening as, as the process of finding you and finding you and finding you is happening, they're melting, right? So, so there's a limit. Even if they're free, there's still a limit as to what I can demand because, I, I mean, realistically, if I get 500, it's just going to go to waste. So 12 is the number for me. All right, as the price starts to go up, my demand starts to fall. So the price of 50, 10, price of a dollar, eight, and so forth down the line, okay? Everybody okay with that? Um, so at a price, just one last, just to make sure we're at a price of 250, I demand two ice cream cones. No problem. Everybody cool with that? Okay, um, the demand curve, and this is more along the lines of what we'll be looking at. The demand curve, and it says a lot of stuff here, but the demand curve is a graph as opposed to a table that shows the law of demand. So the demand curve is a graph that shows the law of demand. Uh, I think a few, I don't know, I know a few students, you know, it's like the whole bad thing about economics, well, one of the bad things is the graphs. And that, that students will say to me, you know, I, it's like I really kind of understood it, but when you started doing the graphs, I just lost it. I mean, it just makes no sense, and my brain doesn't work that way. And um, if We'll start simple and slow and then all that stuff, but if, if for sure, if it's not coming to you and it's not clear where this number came from or that number came from, just let me know, and, and I'm happy to stop and, and talk about it to make sure everybody's clear. And see, it's kind of a weird balance because a lot of folks, of course, are like, yeah, no problem, I don't even need to discuss this, let's just go on. But, but others, you know, it's been a while or, or you haven't addressed graphs ever, and I think there's kind of a mental block with graphs. So if you have any trouble, just, just let me know. It's absolutely not a problem. Okay, so the demand curve is a graph that shows the law of demand. So here's our demand curve. I'll, let me talk about it first and then I'll draw it out. Is that at a price of uh, $3, you can see at the table up here, at a price of $3, we demand zero cones. So at a price of $3, zero cones is demanded. Um, at a price of 50, sorry, at $2.50, which is the next notch down, we demand two, at a price of two dollars, we demand four, and so forth and so on. Um, all the way up to at a price of zero, we demand 12 cones, which would be right there. Okay, um, and so here's the, the demand uh, schedules up there, the demand curve is here, and then all you do basically is connect the dots. I mean, these, each of those is a point in, you know, on the x, y axis. So, you know, it's 50 cents at 10, so, uh, 50 cents and 10, and there's the dot, right? And then it's a uh, dollar and it's eight, there's the dot. And then all you do is connect them up, and there you have it. Um, I wonder, I, I've done this later in the semester. I guess I'll try it now. I, I've done it before and after <coughs> this session, but I want to show you how to derive demand curves. And this this will become, later on, this will become something more that we talk about, but it's just kind of a fun experiment, and it really does work. Um, what's a commodity, and there are for 50 of us in this classroom, what's a commodity that we can all kind of enjoy? Just give me an example. Cheese. Uh, cheese? Trying to go universal. I was thinking more along the lines of, I see, sir. <laughs> you know? But hey, it's cheese. It's your class. Yeah. I'm working with you. Okay. What kind of cheese? Nacho. <laughs> <laughs> this is going from bad to worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody but Sarah. <laughs> Anybody but Sarah answer this next <laughs> Excludes some people, I know it's like, but play along, okay, play along. Pretend like you like nachos. Pretend like you like nacho cheese. <laughs> okay, so um, on this axis is the price of nacho cheese, and and this is a this axis, the um, x-axis is always p, always price. I get students sometimes that I'll turn in homework, 
And, and they'll do it so that the Q is here and the P is here. And, and it's, it's weird. It's not like technically wrong. I mean, well, maybe it is. But, you know, the graph should look, the graph should look like this. And their graph looks like that. And it's like, it's weird because it's like, like fundamentally it's right. But, but it's like, I have to look at it like this. You know what I mean? So, so just to keep that in mind, that the price is always here and the Q is always here. I mean, that's universal. That will go on forever. Okay, um, okay, so what is the absolute most, so let's say I'll, I will supply you with the thing of chips, a little box of, or what is it, the little boat of chips. Nacho and boat. Nacho boat. <laughs> All right, else, those are free. And so absolutely, and, I, and don't be facetious, be kind of honest about this. And we're looking for the highest number that anybody in this room would be willing to pay. What's the absolute, and, and again, don't be, you're gonna be alone, so don't be facetious, but what's the absolute maximum that, that this class would pay for a, a squirt of nacho cheese? A squirt? Uh, two squirt, however many squirts you want. <laughs> sounds, I'll say it sounds gross. <laughs> How, okay, so I need a price, I need the cap. Three bucks, I heard three bucks. Anybody up above three bucks? Six bucks. Six bucks, anybody up above six bucks? All right, that seems like a, an undisputed heavyweight champion right there. All right, so six bucks. Uh, so five, four, three, two, one. Um, Okay, this is how we derive a demand curve. It's really easy, but it's like it, the process in, in, to do it in, on the fly is not so easy. All right, so five, four, uh, <laughs> see what I'm saying? Three, two, one. all right. How many in this classroom, and be completely honest, okay, and, and facetiousness will just screw up our curve, all right? So you gotta be, you know, this is a very serious analysis here. How many people in this room would be willing to pay six dollars for However many squirts of nacho cheese you wish on your chips. How many people? <coughs> we have a winner, a, a nacho cheese lover. So, <clears throat> if we're at a baseball game or something, you pay yeah, like six bucks. Or I kind of under when you said that, I was like, that's not. You know, I would. Yeah. You go to a Dodgers game, it's ten. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah. All right. So we have one. Everything. Yeah. All everything comes with it. Somebody up here is like, do you get jalapenos? <laughs> yep. I'm oh, six bucks. Five dollars. How many of you? And now, if you've already raised your hand, you have to raise it again because I got. I don't want to double count or uncount anybody. Okay. So, how many would be willing to pay five dollars? So, and then just give me a second. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay. So, thirteen. So, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, thirteen. Uh, five dollars. Uh, okay, how many? Oh, so I'll just keep. I'll just remember the thirteen. Okay, so you don't have to raise your hand again. How many would be willing to pay four dollars? You don't. If you raise, it, you don't have to raise it again. So one, two, three. It's, is that a hand? Or are you just thinking? She's. Um, no, you're just thinking. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Anybody else? So. Kind of like off the top of those here. 15, so this would be 26, $4. Um, how many people would be willing to pay $3? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, Okay, how many would be additional people would be willing to pay one dollar? Two? Just two? Alright. So forty eight that's actually pretty accurate because that's about how many people we have in here. Um anybody else that would be willing to pay less than a dollar? <laughs> so this is fifty and then fifty one is uh, 
Okay, you guys ready? Are you sitting down? You guys sitting? Are you ready? I will, this is a nice kind of elementary little graph that will get you started, if it helps. Um, and this, the homework will have this, so I don't know, practice, if you need it, I guess. If you don't, you don't. We 
we have a, okay, and this we'll call this our weekly budget. It doesn't make so, so our weekly budget for Reese's Peanut Butter Cups is $5. Okay, the price at this point costs, the price of a Reese's is a dollar. Of course, in a week, we have $5. How many do we buy? Huh? How many do we buy? Five. Okay, so five, and so we put our point right there. Okay, so there's our demand, right? We have, uh, let me make sure this works. I'm just kind of ballparking, just so I have it. So there we are. That's where we live, and we're happy. I know this, this is. Something in the world happens, and it changes the price. And we'll talk about, that's a different story, and we'll get into that later. But, but for right now, let's say, um, <coughs> what are the factors of production, land, labor, capital? Um, let's say that Reese's are made, manufactured in um, New Orleans or something. The hurricane comes in. I love this story. It's sad. The hurricane comes in. The hurricane comes in and rips the roof off the Reese's peanut butter plant in New Orleans and, and it collapses in and it wipes out the Oompa Loompa population in New Orleans. The Oompa Loompas are gone. We wiped out half the population. So what changed? Land, labor, or capital? Well, the labor supply decreased, right? <laughs> That's so mean. The labor supply decreased. And their capital. The capital equipment was destroyed and probably is, you know, at least not functioning as well as it was. So, so the factors of production changed. So their labor supply decreased, their capital supply decreased, um, land, labor, capital. Probably the land is in and of itself because the, the, I don't know exactly, of course, but I, you know, peanuts are grown in the south and maybe the crops were a bit affected. I, I don't really know that. So, so all these things went into affecting the, the factors of production. We'll just say labor, because labor supply was um, impacted. So now what does the Reese's plant have to do? Hire more people. Hire more Oompa Loompas. But are these Oompa Loompas good? Good at making Reese's? Not necessarily. Are, well, of course they are. They're Oompa Loompas. That's what they do. No. I'm kidding. <laughs> Oompa Loompas, they have to be trained, right? They're, they're not, these are Oompa Loompas that didn't get hired in the first round, so they're not the most skilled. The Oompa Loompas that were working at the plant when the roof collapsed in, those were the skilled workers, right? So now we got to hire these new Oompa Loompas, but we also have to train them, all right? So there's a training cost, so there's a real inefficiency. And so what, what 50 Oompa Loompas used to do, now we have 50 and they can only do half as much, and they don't do it as well, right? It's costing us twice. So it's costing us more, right? Because the, the Reese's plant, they have to pass that cost on to somebody, right? And they're not just going to absorb it. So what happens to the price of Reese's here? Goes up. Goes up. Okay, so now the price, something happened in the world, and the price of Reese's goes up, let's say, to $1.25. Okay, so now, based on that information, what's changed in Reading for us? Besides, you know, it's a very sad time, but what changed? The demand for Reese's. Did our demand change? My demand is exactly like it was yesterday, right? I mean, I, I, I like Reese's exactly the same. I don't have any difference in preference at all. I have the same money. I have the same schedule. I have the same, you know, my five days a week Reese's habit is unchanged. So the only thing that changed was the price, right? And now, yeah. We're going to, we're right there. We're going to talk about it and I'll, we'll get into that right now. My demand, actually, no, it didn't change. What changed is just my ability to buy Reese's based on my available budget, yeah? And so now, I go into the store, I have my $5, and the vendor says, oh, yeah, there was a tragedy in New Orleans, and uh, unfortunately, the price of Reese's went up to $1.25. So what do I do? I shell out the $1.25 on Monday. And on Thursday, I, I go through withdrawals because I only have five bucks. 
So what do I do is I just move along my existing demand curve like this. And now I'm back in balance here buying only four candy bars. Okay, so let me say this again. Movement along the curve is caused by one thing, a change in the price. Okay, so what changes the price? Something else. So, you know, uh, the, the roof collapsing, the weather, the, you know, somebody ought to be more, and so we're not producing as much, or we're producing more, some new technology, who knows. The only thing that causes movement along the curve is a change in the price. I can't say that enough. And students, when you do your homework, you know, they'll, they'll come up with some, not you guys, but we'll come up with some really some creative ways about explaining all this away. When you get down to it, the rule is movement along the curve caused by a change in the price, period. What caused the change in the price? Something else. So we're going to talk about that something else in a minute. And that's step one of this analysis. I saw a hand. Uh, is, um, you're still, even though it's because of that dollar a quarter, you are demanding less. You just got a $5 budget. <coughs> Since my demand isn't changed, it's unchanged. The only thing that's changed is my ability to purchase the good or service. So, so as a function of that, my, as a, with my five dollar budget, I can only buy four uh, resources. Uh, oh, down here and then up there and then over there. Yeah. So this, this is only assuming that you're like uh, responsible for budgeting everything. Right, right. That that your budget is fixed. Yeah. yeah that, people will, like buy a cigarettes a lot. And yeah. Then your budget prices. Exactly. You're you're on to elasticity. You're you're right where we're going. We're right where we're going. Yes, sir. I saw somebody up there. Go ahead. Instead of demanding five at a dollar or, or four at a dollar twenty-five, I, I 
my budget, I'm going to decrease this down to uh, $2.50. Because it's not as good for me as it used to be. So then my demand curve actually shifts. We're going to talk about that in a second. Everybody cool? Okay, so this just shows, and there's an exam question on this. Most people don't have any trouble with this. So it's pretty, it'll be just like this. A movement from point A to point B, <laughs> uh, um, you know, it represents a change in quantity demanded or a movement along the demand curve. So and, uh, let, me, uh, let me write that out because that always is a little bit confusing. So movement, movement along, movement along the curve based on a change in price based on change delta in price is called a change in quantity demand. The other thing that happens, like um, your colleague just pointed out, when the demand actually shifts due to something like the Surgeon General says leases are no good for you, and the demand curve the demand curve, we'll talk about it right now. Demand curve shifts left or right is called a change in demand. All right, so, so movement along the curve is called a change in quantity demanded, and that's caused by a change in the price. When the curve shifts left or right, then we have what's called a change in demand, and that's caused by, there's other things we'll talk about in a minute. So, so changes in demand are caused by other things. How are we doing? sides to the coin. Part part one is, or part two really is this, part one we haven't talked about. It's it's a process. We'll get into that in a second. <coughs> All right, everybody good? Okay. Uh, so the price goes up. We, we don't have any change in demand. We just move along the existing demand. Okay, now shifts in the demand curve. And I'll talk about each of these in a little detail. Um, Shifts in the demand curve are caused by these five things. And I'll, I'll give you examples. <clears throat> okay, okay, so income, change in, uh, changes in uh, related goods. I'll talk about that in a second. Probably one of the more confusing parts of this section. Tastes, expectations, and number of buyers. So this is now, we're talking about this. Changes in demand. As opposed to changes in price, which cause movements. Um, so consumer income, that's pretty easy. If the income goes up, then all of a sudden, let, let me go back and let's say the Oompa Loompas are fine. All right, and so it's a dollar and I'm demanding five. If, I, if my income goes up and it's a normal good, and it means just I can afford more, I buy more, and then this goes to, um, you know, say six dollars that I have budgeted for uh, Reese's, then my demand curve actually will shift out to the right like this. And now at a price of a dollar, I think, or I will buy six. Does that make sense? Um, we'll try, I'll try to go back the other way. So here, here's the same graph. I'll just shift the curve the other way. Um, prices of related goods, I'll, that one's more confusing. Give me a minute to get to that one. Um, so here we are, it's a dollar. Five and the Surgeon General says that Reese's are no good for you. There's too much saturated fat or something like that. So the demand, our demand curve will shift to the left. And now at a price of a dollar, I demand say two. <clears throat> Another, just a note, just a terminology wise. The when a demand curve shifts, it's either to the right or to the left, and that represents an increase or a decrease in demand. Students sometimes will say, well, the demand curve shifted up. And, and that doesn't make sense. I mean, up is which way? 
you know what I mean? Because you could argue, well, up, up like this, or did it shift up because it went increased like this, you know what I mean? It, it's hard to say. So, so it shifts to the right or the left, which represents an increase in demand or a decrease in demand. Expectations, if we just think of it as hoarding or, or dumping product. If, if we know that the storm is coming and we know that the um, Reese's plant is right at the edge of the uh, one of those walls they have in New Orleans, the retainer walls there. They're levees, yeah, that the, they're right there. And we love Reese's and we experienced this problem last year when they had the storm that we'll go down to um, the 7-Eleven and we'll buy a bunch of Reese's. So here we are, one dollar, five, but we know the storm is coming so our demand shifts this way and for that week we buy 10. Um, number of buyers, that's simple enough. Is that as if you and I, okay, I tell you about Reese's, oh, they're awesome, we go from one to five. Now you say, hey, that's they're awesome, I agree with you. So you go from one to five, and so now the market is increased one to two, ten. You know, number of buyers just shifts the demand curve out to the right. Cool? Easy, huh? All right. Um, hmm? I'm going to do that one now. Price of related goods is probably the most tricky part of this. Everybody okay? Uh, change in demand shifts to the left or the right caused by one of those five things. Um, and then here it is just, you know, here's the, an increase in demand due to, um, what was the reason? Oh, our budget goes up. A decrease in demand because the Surgeon General says that Snickers or Reese's are no good for you. All right, so there it is. Same thing up down here. And then this is a summary of what we just talked about. So a change in the price causes movement along the curve. A change in the price is caused by something else in the world. Something happened. And we'll, we'll put it all together in a second. But So something happened caused the price to go up. We move, our demand doesn't change, and we move up or down our existing demand curve based on the change in the price. So we go from five stick, or Reese's down to four Reese's because we have a budget of a dollar. Um, price changes moves us up and down the demand curve. Changes in tastes, price of related goods, income, number of buyers, and expectations causes the demand curve to shift right up. Cool? Easy? Everybody okay with that? Right. Look, let me do the, the uh, related goods, I won't we'll call it. And for those of you who are in the repeat class, the second of the two, um, for sure we'll be done on um, Tuesday. We'll be done with the repeat stuff on Tuesday, for sure. Okay, normal inferior goods, definitely on the exam. <coughs> normal goods are goods that as your income increases, you tend to buy more. And inferior goods are goods that as your income increases, you tend to buy less. So what's an example of a normal good? Pretty much everything's a normal good. What's an example? A car. Yeah, a car. So, you know, a brand new, not a new car, but a new car to you. As your income goes up, you'll tend to buy more cars. Um, as your income goes up, you tend to buy more steak, you tend to buy more movies, you tend to buy more um, iPhone 5s, you tend to buy more... Who's going to get an iPhone 5, by the way? Who's just one? I'm going to wait, I think. Wait till all the bugs are worked out. They look cool. I hate the fact the charger is different, though. Yeah. Yeah. But they said they're going to sell adapters, you know. For like 30 bucks. 30 yeah. bucks. Which is, you might as probably what the charger will cost. Yeah. I'm going to wait till all the bugs are worked out. I'm going to buy it in November. Now's the time to buy an iPhone 4S because they're super cheap. $99. Yeah. And in September, or late, I think October, you'll get an upgrade for the new iOS system that they're putting on the side. Oh, really? Uh -huh. Okay, so iPhone 5s are. Aha! iPhone 5s are normal goods. iPhone 4s? You think so? 
Yeah, yeah, if your income goes up, you're going to buy more or less iPhone 4s. Probably less, yeah? <laughs> yeah, so I was just thinking that actually. <laughs> so for some people, okay, what's the quintessential inferior good? Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> that, that answer came just kind of way too fast. <laughs> I know. Taco Bell, I like Taco Bell. Ramen. Taco Bell, is that an inferior good? No. <laughs> really? Mm -mm. No, it's good. It's normal. I like Taco Bell. Um, I think, okay, so if your income goes up, are you going to buy more or less Taco Bell? We'll probably do about the same. <laughs> about the same. Less. 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 So for you, it's an inferior good. Okay, the quintessential inferior good, so whatever you said it. Top ramen. And I know what you guys are thinking is, no, top ramen, it's not. It's a normal good. I love it. I eat it. I, I sleep with my thing. I crunch it in the thing. I just love it. Well, truth is, and I know you don't believe me, but truth is, is as you get older and you make a little bit more money and you, 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 you're graduating from Top Ramen, you'll move on to a cup of noodles. <laughs> Yo, you will, I promise. When I was in college, you want to know what I lived on? No joke. I lived on Top Ramen, which was the go-to. And <clears throat> what I used to do is go buy the the cheapy brand spaghetti, the inferior brand spaghetti sauce, the Safeway, you know, 99 cents a bottle. And I would just, you know, boil up my ramen, spaghetti sauce, done. It was good, try it, it's really good. There was that, and then the other thing I lived on was, we lived, where I lived, there was a 7-Eleven right behind us. And um, I got to know the guy and kind of knew their schedule, and you know that little hot dog wheel? <laughs> Well, I got to know when they would throw the hot dogs away. Oh, no. Hey, they were fine. They were a little wrinkled up, but they were fine. So what I would do is I went down to where I bought my spaghetti sauce, and I bought a loaf of bread for 99 cents. I got to know the dude, and he'd, you know, kind of, he'd wait for me to show up to throw away the five or ten hot dogs that were left over. I'd take the hot dogs, you know, put them in the fridge, and I'd take the hot dog, put it on the bread, and then go back into 7-Eleven where the condiments are free. And I would get jalapenos and lettuce and tomatoes and, you know, just just load it up, you know what I mean? So I had a salad with a hot dog under there somewhere. And I lived on that. I lived on that for two years. Don't be jealous. <laughs> um, okay, another inferior good, just to give you one more example, would be a bus pass probably. I know in San Francisco it's a different story because it's kind of cool to ride the bus or cool to use public transit. <laughs> But, but here, I don't care how cool you think you are, sitting there waiting for the bus and, you know, trying to look cool just ain't going to work out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like sitting there waiting for the bus and, you know, giving everybody stink eye. I <laughs> mean, yeah, you're tough. <laughs> when you catch a ride, maybe I'll see you down the street some more. Oh, this is so, this is crap, this is no big deal. Um, increasing demand for a normal good causes, and this would be, uh, again, somebody mentioned uh, cars or steak or pretty much anything, you know, anything you'd buy more of as your income goes up. This is top ramen bus passes. If your income goes up, you tend to demand less. Or another way, look, if your income goes down, you'll tend to demand more of these kinds of things. Okay, I always have trouble with this, and so, so kind of bear with me. We'll, we'll get through this. This is on the exam, and it's always confusing for me anyway. I hope, I hope you guys don't find it that way. Substitutes and complements. All right, substitute goods. And, and I have to read this, and then I'll explain it, all right? When a fall in the price of one good reduces the demand for another good, the two are called sub substitutes. And I'll give you an example. So a fall in the price of one good reduces the demand for the other good, their substitutes. And I would definitely write that. So off the top of your head, what's an example of substitute goods? Pepsi, Pepsi and Coke. Okay, Pepsi and Coke. So follow the money. If the price of Pepsi falls, what happens?
happens to the demand for coke and why? It falls. It goes down because people will just either pay less for Pepsi and it's not their first choice. Okay, good. The, well, you said it perfectly. Let me repeat what you said because it was just right. So, as the price of Pepsi falls, the demand for coke also falls because people will gravitate towards Pepsi because the price went down. So, even coke drinkers will move to Pepsi because it's relatively less expensive than Coke. And as a result, the demand for Coke will go down as the price of Pepsi goes down. Go for it. Would that also affect the price of Coke that drop? Yeah, you know, yeah. It, but Coke's, remember Coke is also pretty PC, pretty um, perfectly competitive. And so, so they're, they're so big, you know, one little niche market or one little grocery store or something that has that price variable on Pepsi probably isn't really going to impact them that much. But in the big spectrum of things, yes. And to answer your question, if it was a, a single grocery store we're looking at, that as that happens, then the price of Coke, because the demand curve has shifted away from it, the price will tend to start to fall. And then I wonder in a lot of ways, as I say this, is if that isn't what really drives that back and forth process, you know? Yeah, good point, good point. Uh, somebody else? No, out of the corner, okay. So as the price of Pepsi falls, the demand for Coke will tend to go down. Okay, complementary goods. Um, when a fall in the price of one good increases the demand for the other good, they are complementary goods. Um, example of a complementary good. Peanut butter and jelly. That's the, the, the go-to. What would you say? Peanut butter and jelly. So as the price of peanut butter goes, let's see, a fall in the price. So as the price of peanut butter goes down, what happens to the demand for jelly and why? It goes up. Why? Because people want to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> you said that with a lot of gusto. Because yeah. PBJ's rule. That's what we do. Nachos and PBJ. Nachos and PBJ. <laughs> I know we're not going to in our food example anymore. <laughs> All right, so fall of uh, money. As the price of peanut butter falls, and again, just to kind of rabbit hole you, just to kind of give you a sense of where this comes from. So what caused the price of peanut butter to go down? Something else, which was, just give, make it up. What, what, what caused it to fall? Technology, yeah, so some new harvesting process made t harvesting peanuts more efficient, so the price went down. Okay, so the price of peanut butter falls, the demand for jelly will tend to go up because we have, now we can buy with our five bucks, we buy six jars of peanut butter. Now we have that extra jar of peanut butter, so what do we need to complement that with? Thank Another jar of jelly. So, so the, the, as the price of peanut butter falls, the demand for jelly tends to go up. Go ahead. No, the, or the, was that the same? Did it just go along the Exactly. The, the movement along the curve, yeah. So, so the price fell for peanut butter, so now we just slide down our existing curve. The price changed, we moved down our existing curve, and now instead of buying five jars of peanut butter, we buy six. With that That's same five dollars. And now as a result of that, we have that extra jar, so we need to buy one more jar of jelly. Yeah, good, good point. Anybody else? Any questions about that? Be ready for this on the exam, for sure. Um, any other questions? We will do um, homework number three. I'll have that out today, probably tomorrow. I, I've still got to finish some grading, so that's a priority. And then once that's done, I'll release homework three, which is supply, demand, elasticity. Um, I'll have your grades done and back to you guys in, uh, by, by Tuesday, Tuesday, for sure. Um, anything else? Have a good week. Not of the whole thing, yeah. He's very articulate sometimes.